Okay, I think we'll start. And as people come in, uh, they'll join throughout the presentation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the to another edition of celebrating 10 years of the Global One Health Initiative at Ohio State. And today's presentation is focused on partnerships throughout Latin America. I'm Tanya Berger Wolf. I'm director of the Translational Data Analytics Institute and professor of computer science and engineering, electrical and computer engineering, and evolution ecology and organismal biology at the Ohio State University. And Translational Data Analytics Institute is uh, proud and happy to partner with GoHi on various uh, initiatives now and in the future. With that, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker will, uh, will be Dr. Enrique Delgado Suarez, talking about overcoming NGS barriers in developing countries, a success case in Mexico throughout Go High support. Dr. Delgado Suarez is a full professor of food safety and public health <clears throat> and the faculty of veterinary medicine at uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He does research in comparative genomics of foodborne and waterborne pathogens with focus on virulence and antimicrobial resistance. And he got his PhD uh, in 2019 from uh, UNAM, but he's participated in GoHa long before. He started as a research scholar in 2011 through the USDA Norman Burlock Fellowship and joined ICOPHAI in 2013 and attended its congresses in 2017 and 2019. He collaborated in um, go, uh, go High training activities in Brazil in 2017 and 2018 and collaborated in the last four of OCHSI uh, in Ethiopia, Kenya, and online in the last two years. He's been an active participant and leader in Go High activities. With that, Dr. Delgado Suarez. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here celebrating this 10th anniversary. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you some of our experiences here in Mexico that may be common to other developing countries. And I want to share how we managed to overcome uh, these barriers that we may all find. Um, it's my my screen is uh, visible already. Yes. And now in presentation mode. Okay. So one of the things that we face here is that uh, we have uh, when we're talking about infectious diseases, and I'm going to focus on foodborne diseases here, uh, is that we have uh, a passive epidemiological surveillance. Uh, that means uh, the health authorities do not uh, pursue, they, they, don't, they do not analyze uh, blood samples or food samples, and they do not confirm uh, which is the, the pathogen involved in, in an infection. This represents some uh, uh, disadvantages that we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, for instance, here's the, a report from the passive uh, epidemiological surveillance systems in Mexico. Uh, we only have data uh, of the top five foodborne diseases. But if we see here the share, the share of unknown uh, causes is most of it. Mostly uh, nine out of 10 uh, infections, they do not know the causative agent. And even for this, the, the top five, this is based on clinical uh, appraisal. It is not based on laboratory confirmed cases. So this is the first uh, barrier that, that we have to deal with because uh, NGS, when we're talking about whole genome sequencing, uh, it is strongly oriented toward risk management and prevention of infectious diseases. But uh, it is difficult if you don't know what is the causative agent to, to elaborate on risk factors, to analyze the dynamics of transmission or to type, <clears throat> sorry, 
to to type uh, to, to do some straight typing string typing um, strategies to identify uh, involved genetic factors or differentiate between virulence versus uh, less virulent phenotypes or pathovars versus non pathovars etc. So why why is passive surveillance uh, occurring in this context? Because it is simple and cheap. Uh, the routine reporting uh, is not a complicated uh, workflow, and uh, the output is mostly statistics. So what we find when we check these databases is uh, what are the common diseases according to age, uh, region of the country, etc. What are the disadvantages? Uh, this, there is a limited or no flow, uh, no follow up efforts at all. Uh, to understand what are the implicated foods, the implicated pathogens, what are possible interventions uh, that uh, may be uh, used to contain these diseases, what are the public health goals. So uh, th this does not integrate research and microbiological data into the system. And th there has been some, some progress, nevertheless, in the last years. However, this is not driven by one, uh, one health approach. Uh, the, the main cause be behind this uh, developing uh, or growing work in this area is driven by the intense food, the intense commercial exchange. For instance, between the US and Mexico, um, we have a laboratory for pathogen detection and whole genome sequencing that is homologated to the ones at the FDA. But this is done because of the importance of a uh, food exchange between Mexico and the US and uh, the laboratory at Senasica, which is the equivalent of the FSIS at the USDA, um, is, um, is part of the FDA's genome tracker uh, laboratory network. So the idea is to follow up on the strains that are involved in outbreaks. We had a recent outbreak of uh, salmonella linked to onions. Uh, maybe you are aware of that in the US, and it was uh, an onion from Mexico, right? So this laboratory is, is, is working on that. There are some uh, research centers all across Mexico that have also some infrastructure to do research, but this is all scattered. This is really not integrated. And conversely, or ironically, what we see in government laboratories is that there is a growing stock of isolates because they are, they are uh, really analyzing a, a considerable amount of isolates. But this is done in the frame of official surveillance, which is linked to trade. So data sharing is very limited because uh, the information is considered confidential and it is not integrated into the system. So the second barrier, the second important barrier that we face here is the opaque regulations that we have and the lack of transparency. When I talk about opaque is that when you look for the text of the regulations, there is no, uh, it, it is not stated anywhere that it is forbidden to, to share certain types of information. But, but at the moment it is linked to trade, it is considered very sensitive information and therefore it is not integrated in any public database or system that you can uh, consult. consult. When we talk about research institutions, as I mentioned earlier, there are some, several of them, with a good infrastructure, some examples here. However, uh, the funding bodies have their own research priorities, at least it was that way until recently. And uh, for instance, when we look, when we have a look at the research funding uh, money, uh, in the period of 2009-2013, the, the Mexican government invested uh, nearly 38 million US dollars in research in the agriculture area. However, from this part, only 0.4% was dedicated to food safety infectious diseases. So this is a very limited funding. You cannot really progress in adopting NGS technologies uh, with uh, such a little amount of money. So the third barrier that we identify is that uh, NGS, at least not quite yet, consider uh, priority research by funding bodies, 
we hope this will change or it is already changing but things move slow with the government as it may be the case uh, everywhere else right what are the alternatives for local researchers and uh, I'm, I'm jumping in into the success case that we experience here uh, to increase collaboration both locally and internationally because the first barrier which is really the one of the toughest when we want to progress in adopting new technologies is the lack of this technology it is very inaccessible in terms of financial resources and also qualified personnel to handle it uh, it may be i'm sure it is common to all of our countries developing countries there is a lack of uh, skilled uh, skilled personnel and lack of money to adopt these uh, new technologies. So let's talk about how we managed to set up the whole genome sequencing, or uh, we call it uh, comparative genomics, focused on salmonella in Mexico, with, uh, despite having uh, a very poor lab in terms of uh, equipment and technology. So uh, I'm going to, to make a, a very brief history of the whole process. My first contact with the with Gohive was when I uh, spent about a bit more than two months at the Ohio State University when I was a, a research scholar with the Norman Borlaug Fellowship. That was back in 2011. Uh, after that, we came back to Mexico. This fellowship uh, requires that the scholars had to reproduce the project that they the, that we conducted in the US back in your country so i did that there were some uh, master of thesis uh, coming out from this uh, project and there were some isolates of salmonella coming out as well of this project so um, after having some isolates i was uh, invited to integrate into icofe in 2013 i did such and from this moment on i was actively participating fortunately in 2014 there was an agreement between the go high uh, at that moment was mostly called ICOFI and the FDA through the Genome Tracker Initiative. And the agreement was to uh, do whole genome sequencing for thousands of Salmonella isolates a year. So uh, um, I took advantage of that. I did my PhD thesis uh, in this period with the isolates coming out from the previous projects. And uh, this um, collaboration helped me to integrate some other research centers in Mexico, like the Centers for uh, Human Health uh, Research and Development in Nuevo León State. It's in the north, Monterrey. You're familiar with the city. It's in Monterrey City in Nuevo León State. And also the Center for Advanced Research, which has a unit in Irapuato. They have a very nice uh, facility there they are uh, they are equipped with uh, cutting edge technology for do whole genome for doing whole genome sequencing and also uh, bioinformatics so this was possible was a, this was the first uh, positive experience that we have uh, we did a, the conventional microbiology in our labs and all of the rest sequencing in the us data analysis uh, somewhere else in mexico so in this way, we, we managed to, to start up the research line, the research line that, that I was talking about earlier, comparative genomics of football pathogens. In our faculty, we were uh, pioneers in this because uh, we only have a, um, an ion proton sequencer at the faculty. At that moment, we still are in the same situation, but we hope hopefully it will change uh, soon. So we, we started up this line back in 2015. Out of my PhD project, we did two publications and in, in very, very nice journals, international journals. And uh, we are happy that we have, we have been cited a little bit already from 2018 up to now. This, this was the second publication. So we were contributing already in international, relevant international journals in this area. Before finishing my PhD, I engaged in a second Salmonella project just as a participant because I was still a, a PhD fellow. And, um, but I, I led the whole process of whole genome sequencing arranging. And for the first time, we involved Senesica 
a government agency in the process. And they did the whole genome sequencing of the isolates coming out from this project. So this was a uh, thank, uh, thank you, thanks to the uh, collaboration because uh, ironically, the contact with Senasica did not come from inside the country, but it was through FDA and this collaboration with Go High. It was the FDA that mentioned to Senasica that we were working on this area and then Senasica approached us to uh, collaborate. So this is why I mentioned this. We, can, uh, we produced uh, several publications out of this project, at least two, and there are two others in preparation. This was published in the in a Mexican journal, and this one uh, is uh, very recent in PLOS One. And I'm very happy that even though it just came out, we already have one citation. By the end of my, my PhD, there was a third Salmonella project. This was a this is a big one because it started in 2019. We were negotiating it uh, in, in 20, 2018 with the University of Maryland and several Latin American universities from Brazil. Sorry, I put Brazil in Spanish. I forgot. Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, and thousands of Salmonella isolates are uh, mostly so far have been isolated from this uh, from this project. This project was also possible through this relationship and collaboration with GoHai and FDA. The contact again came from uh, the US. And then we have a Forza Salmonella National Project. This is a, a focus on antimicrobial resistance of Salmonella from foods of animal origin. We estimate because it just started this year, we have been sampling for about five to six months and we already have nearly 200 salmonella isolates. So we expect, because it's a, uh, this is a two-year sampling period, uh, we expect to, to collect from five to 800 salmonella isolates. So if you see, we've been growing and growing and uh, being able to, to engage in a, in a lot of activities and contributing to science, which are going to summarize in a little bit, uh, in a little bit more of minutes. So, uh, we were also, as um, Tanja was commenting at the beginning when she was introducing me, engaged in Goha international activities as well. Uh, we, we participated in several, at least two ICOFI congresses, uh, the 2017 edition in Qatar, Doha, Qatar, and in Canada in 2019. And uh, out of that, we were proposed, we participated in the bite for uh, being venue for this Congress in 2023. For 2021, it was supposed to be um, France, but due to the COVID pandemic, it was not possible, it was canceled. So we hope we can resume these Congresses, which will be called Go High Global One Health Congresses, not uh, ICOFI anymore. And uh, as you mentioned also, uh, we conducted training activities in Brazil at the Paraíba Federal University. Uh, we, went, we attended the Congress in 2017. Uh, a small course actually was not a Congress. Uh, and in 2018, uh, we stayed there for almost two weeks uh, doing training in bioinformatics and whole genome sequencing. And also in the Ohio, uh, One Health, sorry, One Health Summer Institute, my first one uh, was in Ethiopia in 2018, and then uh, we went in 2019 to Nairobi, Kenya for the second one, and we've been participating continuously from, from then. So what has been the impact of this collaboration facilitated and promoted through GoHai's uh, help? So building capacity, which is uh, one of the cornerstones of GoHai, uh, is one of the key things right, that we have experienced here in Mexico. So trained personnel, I can, I can tell you that uh, we have several graduate students from Master of that uh, already have some training in whole genome sequencing and bioinformatics. Uh, there are eight of them that have participated in this project. We have one, uh, PhD student that graduated, which is me, <laughs> which is myself. And there is another one in process. 
And there is also a postdoc which is going on in my faculty right now, which is also uh, who is also involved in this uh, in these projects. And uh, we contributed to personal training somewhere else in the in the world, especially in Brazil and East Africa, as I commented earlier. Building capacity in terms of local and international engagement. So we expanded our local collaboration with three research centers in Mexico and a government agency that is part of the HDS Genome Tracker Network. And we expanded international collaboration to seven universities from Brazil, Chile, the US, including, of course, uh, the Ohio State University. In terms, of, in terms of technology availability, we have improved our equipment and infrastructure of our local research facilities. Uh, we have, um, it, it may sound very simple, but uh, we already have two uh, deep freezers, which uh, were uh, strange things to mention in our lab a few months ago. Now we have two to preserve our isolates. Uh, we have new equipment for uh, conducting PCR, etc. And we are still planning to to move forward and keep uh, improving our laboratory equipment. And this year, we participated with uh, another US institution in a CDC um, a, a project, in a CDC call for a research project. And the aim was to equip our lab with uh, a sequencer, right? Both uh, NGS, second, second generation sequencing, and also the third one, the, the whole genome, uh, the back pile, but the one, the small one, the minion. But uh, this project was approved, but there was no, uh, they didn't uh, allocate any money so far because they wanted to make sure the, the let's say the agreement between Mexican and US universities, Brazil is also involved in this project, by the way. Um, it was more, more formal, right? They wanted to see like sub awards, this kind of things. So the, the money was not allocated this year, but hopefully next year. And some, if, if it is not this way, we'll find a way, but uh, we will have our own sequencer soon. And also uh, in bioinformatics, we, we managed to buy a small cluster. It is very small, but at least we can do independently our bioinformatic analysis uh, in-house. In terms of contribution to science, we have uh, published seven peer review articles since then, and we have contributed to public databases around 1,000 salmonella isolates, and it is growing. This is growing as the project's going on. So as a conclusion, uh, I would say that if we want to overcome barriers uh, everywhere in developing countries, collaboration is essential both locally and internationally. Internationally, and in this way, the engagement with GoHai was uh, a key factor uh, to this success. Finally, uh, I would like to stress that the teamwork and the One Health approach are also essential and will further strengthen uh, our progress in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Delgado Suarez, for a very impressive presentation, not only uh, impressive in its own right, but uh, the way you overcome the barriers, which are significant, and you've outlined quite a few of them. So, you know, part of it also comes from this model of doing science, which we've often seen where the sophisticated technology and methodologies are concentrated in a few countries. And the rest of the world is essentially the source of data and publications. The, it is becoming more acutely so with the advent of artificial intelligence and massive data processing, because that, that methodology, that expertise is even more concentrated in even fewer countries. You've talked about overcoming barriers that exist within you know, uh, Mexico, but to, to change the model of this of science where expertise exists in few places, we need to change the culture in those places that produce expertise. How do you see these partnerships 
through uh, through centers like Gohai, changing the culture globally of collaboration. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, these success cases help a little bit, but if we want to really improve the situation, uh, I would uh, I tend to think I believe that uh, it is through international agreements if we if we make some uh, this cultural change in international agencies for instance uh, I, I i have a very recent experience with the um, global uh, global health uh, world health organization with the who initiative for combating antimicrobial resistance we have very little development in this area in mexico however since this agreement was uh, uh, this global was launched, this global initiative was launched. The Mexican government adhered to this to this initiative, and there is already a national plan to combat antimicrobial resistance. And there is money being allocated for different government agencies. So I believe that it is through international agreements in international organizations that national governments may engage easier and this will lead to changes uh, let's say faster than just a cultural change because cultural change is kind of a um, abstract thing so if, if we if we if we really want to to change the actual course of uh, events we need to convince government and we have uh, something that is more concrete something that is very specific we're going to do this we're going to do that there is change in the policies, whatever. So uh, in my experience here, it works better when it comes from international agreements. And in that sense, I took part in the Global Microbial Identifier Congress in 2018. We were talking about these topics as well. And one of the things that uh, we were discussing was this, uh, how to convince local governments, because we have all the barriers that are not related to science, which, uh, which is corruption, political issues, many things but when, when it comes and in the in the law let's say the law structure of mexico international agreements have a very a very heavy portion it's a it's, it's a top together with the constitution is a little bit above and then comes international agreements so this is a very at least in mexico i don't know other countries a, a better way to to change things fast Thank you. And to pick up on something that you just said, part of it is international agreements and obviously um, resources, right? Global international resources, money talks. Uh, but the other part you just said is that scientists also have a voice in convincing with results, right? And changing local, at least local policy. Can you talk a little bit about this? What what role can scientists play in changing policy and changing attitude and resource allocation and the priorities of yeah government? this is a very thank you this is a very tough area because we are kind of trapped <clears throat> as i mentioned in my slides you see there is very little money dedicated to this area and i find it very um i don't know how to say it but it's kind of funny because they give you very little money here and even then, they ask you to publish in very reputed journals and to do cutting edge research, which is impossible, really. But uh, as I mentioned, we managed to do that with, through collaboration. And uh, the good thing that I experienced is that the government is it's opening their doors to us. And even then, the money is not there as a funding uh, a formal funding for a financial project for to finance a project a research project the doors are wide open for me for instance because they see that we have been uh, doing things and accomplishing results and publishing so they are very happy and uh, we have had financial support from the government let's say uh, not in terms of money but in terms of uh, sequencing isolates for free for us, which is uh, a lot of money involved in there. So um, once you overcome and you manage to do this step, but it is very tough. This is not a very a very easy thing to do. 
because if you don't have money, then you cannot do the research. So that's why I mentioned we are kind of trapped. But at, uh, at the time, you really uh, share information with them. And in the case of the Mexican government, which is also kind of trapped with this uh, linked trade uh, situation of data, the data is linked to trade. They are not allowed to use it for anything else. So when they collaborated with us, this data becomes public. We, we don't have this, uh, this problem of uh, confidentiality, whatever. So they are happy to participate. And I would say that would be the, at least here, it's a way to, to open the doors. Thank you. And uh, I want to invite also the audience uh, to use the Q&A function of Zoom to post questions. After presentation of uh, Dr. Vieira, we, we will have a panel. And please, uh, for the audience, feel free to post questions in the Q&A uh, part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the setup. Can so I make with a that, comment, Tanya? Yes, of course. Just to complete the, the, the thinking is what, what, what Enrique uh, told us now is, is really uh, good because in Brazil is the same. So we have been for the last 20 years uh, increasing the number of published articles. But what we clearly see is that we do not have products like patents. And the reason is why for, for years, the scientific policies uh, from our uh, regulatory agents, I would say CAP is here because it's the one that is uh, looking the graduate programs, they push us to publish. It doesn't matter uh, quality, it, it is a matter of numbers. So from some years now, they are changing looking trying to to change the the, um, the metrics and going to an international one like uh, impact factor and other uh, metrics but they are also uh, pushing us for internationalization we have the print uh, copy print project and also they are pushing us to 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 show on our reports uh, some patents or products but the 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 clear thing is that although they are pushing us the universities in general are not prepared so i i can count on my in one hand how many universities in brazil have a section to help the researcher to protect her product or to how to handle in order to, to register the product uh, prior a publication. So this, this, this is something that we really need like a world task force to, to, to change otherwise. Thank you, yeah. So, and thank you for really going straight into this discussion that um, I'm, I hope we will continue after your presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Rafael Felipe da Costa Vieira, um, who will talk about the Global Health, One Health Initiative in Latin America, 10 years building capacity for one health approach. Um, Dr. Uh, Rafael Vieira is an associate professor of epidemiology of vector-borne diseases and One Health in the Department of Veterinary Medicine at Universidade Federal do Paraná. Uh, the Federal University of Paraná, Brazil, and the research leader of the Vector Borne Disease Laboratory and an affiliate of the Global One Health Initiative at The Ohio State University. Dr. Vieira's research interests focus on infectious diseases with emphasis on vector borne and transboundary zoonotic diseases and global health. Dr. Vieira also uh, focuses on mo molecular detection and characterization of hematropic microplasma species and evaluation and validation of diagnostic tests for zoonotic infectious diseases. With that, Dr. Vieira. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. So can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, so thanks again for 
the the honor to be here on this uh, celebration uh, activities. It is a great pleasure for me representing the, the Latin American, let's say Brazil team. So I will, uh, I just combine in here some uh, key uh, events and achievements that our group uh, had uh, over these years. And, and I, for that, I would like to really start at the beginning. So uh, the beginning uh, started in the Paraíba state, Brazil, uh, with Professor Celso Oliveira. He's unfortunately is in a, in a board in another university this week. But I think that we could not start uh, talking about Latin America, specifically uh, in Brazil, without uh, mentioning uh, his name and also uh, Professor Laura Santos, both uh, from the Federal University of Paraíba, where I also started as a faculty back in 2011. And I moved to the southern part uh, in 2014. So the Federal University of Paraíba is a huge uh, uh, university in Northeast Brazil. So here we have a, a, an aerial view of the main campus. But I would like also to mention the Campus uh, 2, which is based in Areia City in Brazil, in, in Paraíba which is uh, where, where we have the College of Agricultural Sciences, where uh, Professor uh, Celso is based. So it's a small city, 35,000 people there. And it's where we have a very good lab there uh, hosted by uh, Professor Celso. So from this university, we have really to highlight the achievements of these two uh, distinct professors. We, we have here a picture of Professor Laura Santos. He's working uh, with um, antimicrobial resistance and One Health for the last years. He's our uh, ambassador at each ICOFE uh, and is really a uh, uh, very uh, good faculty on, on making, making teams and building capacity. And Professor Celso uh, is also a very, uh, very long time uh, partner uh, of Go High. Uh, it was the one, it is one of the funding members of the ICOFA. So I really would uh, like to highlight uh, both uh, works here. So I, I brought some remembering, uh, stark reminders for, for you guys. So. Professor Celso holds the first summer program between Ohio State University and Federal University of Paraíba back in 2007, when we received uh, some Ohio State University students to perform some uh, food board and antimicrobial resistance studies. And of course, we have to highlight the second edition of the ICOFA. So we had a pre-Congress named Molecular Epidemiology and Applications in Foodborne, Nosocomia and Vector-Borne Infectious Disease of Global Significance in Porto de Galinhas, Pernambuco. We have a very huge uh, Congress. The pre-Congress, we had 55 attendees from all over the world. Uh, most of them were fully uh, funded by, by the, the grants that we approved. Uh, to make uh, the ICOFA possible uh, for GARTI, NIH, uh, and many others, CNPK, KPs, FAPESP, and, and, and many others, and FACEP in Pernambuco as well, uh, with which uh, Professor uh, Mateus Matiusi approved. So we really made a very strong team in order to make it possible to, to have the ICOFA in Brazil. It was really a uh, busy week, uh, many uh, great uh, lectures and partnerships and projects that we also do during ICOFA events. And this is, this is, these were one of the uh, big projects and achievements that we have performed over these years. 
I would like to remember some uh, also partnerships that GoHi is a member. Here we have uh, a meeting from IMPRA, which is the uh, antimicrobial resistant Brazilian Institute. We have 12 associated labs, more than 25 researchers now, 15 international collaborators, mainly from US and Europe. And you have many uh, publications and uh, public data already uh, available. And I would also like to highlight that. Over the years, uh, uh, the UFPB team really worked on capacity building. So I think that it is what we are here. So Go High, uh, led uh, amazingly by uh, Dr. Gebayers, is really focused on that. So let's build capacity to have a better and safety and healthy world. So Professor Celso also led this project along with the University of Nottingham. And we had a very good week on a short course entitled Applying Cutting Edge Genomic Technology to Prevent the Global Emergence of Antimicrobial Resistance at the Human Animal Environment Interface. So we also sponsored uh, students to come to be trained. And of course, interactions and projects uh, started from this uh, course. We had another course, Professor Enrique just mentioned. Professor Enrique stayed at Alea City uh, for uh, two weeks, uh, training students on comparative bacterial genomics, uh, raw data, and, and NGS uh, sequencing. Also, we had some good courses on bioinformatics for microbiome analysis also in 2018. This course was uh, thought by Dr. Victor Pirlo, which is the coordinator of the Brazilian Microbiome Project. It's a great partner of Professor Salso and, and many other activities. So combining our team, UFPB, Univospi, and UFPR, on the last five years, we have more than 150 publications and, and products. So we are really trying to do better with the little amount of resource that, that our government uh, provided by science. So I'd like to jump now to another partner, which is located in Petrolina City, uh, Pernambuco State, Northeast of Brazil. They are both side-by-side -side states. So Petrolina is divided by this bridge. Here is Pernambuco State, and here is the state of uh, Bahia, which is Juazeiro. You can see that it's a huge city, and combined it both, we have more than a million uh, people uh, population. So P Petrolina is uh, really uh, getting worldwide uh, uh, knowledge on by the international trade of fruits. So they export fruits uh, all over the world, mainly to Asia. So grapes, mango, and, and many others uh, just go there due to, to their arid uh, climate, which make uh, the fruits like amazingly uh, sweet. And of course, the, the city is famous by the small ruminants production. So we had a lot of goats. Here we have uh, Professor Mateus, which is really uh, working hard on antimicrobial resistance, my, my studies and, and food uh, safety. So we have the Federal University of San Francisco Valley, UNIVASF. It is a huge university uh, in Brazil and we have a lot of health uh, courses. And we have uh, two faculties that I would like to highlight here for some achievements. So the first one is Professor Mateus. Matthew Zida Costa is a very long time partner of Go High, one of the leaders during the ICOFA in Brazil in 2013. His work is mainly focused on micro, microorganisms and biotechnology applied to uh, agropecuary in Brazil and semi arid region, antimicrobial resistant. Professor Mateus now is working also on drug discovery using native uh, plants from the Katinga biome and of course, One Health Actions. So he leads 
along with his partners, two uh, labs. One is the Microorganisms and Biotechnology, and another one is a Center for Open Access of Genomic Analysis, which they're named as the Kalango uh, Network. So I would like to highlight um, some uh, awards that Univasp team is uh, getting. So the first one I would like to highlight the Rodolfo Peixot uh, Award during uh, Professor Mateo's uh, supervision on the treatment of goat's mastitis experimentally induced by Staphylococcus aureus using a formulation containing a Hemenia martiniana extract. So this word, uh, this work received uh, a distinct award uh, on our um, Brazilian meeting, uh, highlighting the importance of the data. Another factor is, is Professor Alexander Silva. His main uh, research focus is diagnostic imaging, but he has been working on the last years on the mental health uh, of veterinary. Uh, in Brazil, and I would like to highlight some data from his uh, past master's students and now uh, PhD student. So Karina has presented the cross-sectional uh, mental health and social skills data on veterinary residents from the state of Pernambuco in Brazil. She was awarded on the last uh, year a Global One Health Conference. And now she's uh, working on his PhD, leaded by Professor Alishani in a multi-centric study entitled Cross-Sectional Study on the Mental Health of Veterinarians, Prevalence and Social Demographic Related Factors. So it is not a, a new thing that veterinarians are among, amongst the highest rates of suicides in the world. So it is a very important and distinct uh, One Health uh, study. So now we are almost close to the end. So I'd like to invite you to come to Curitiba now, which is in the southern part of Brazil. I'm not from here, actually. I'm, my hometown is Pernambuco State, but I'm here since 2014, uh, trying to uh, build some studies on vector-borne sites. So Curitiba is the biggest, biggest city in Brazil. We have an estimated population considered the metropolitan area of 3.2 million people. Although we are a capital city, we were elected uh, by UNESCO as a green city due to the large amount of uh, green parks and, and, and environmental protection laws, uh, very strong which make us a very uh, good and healthy uh, city to live. So the Federal University of Paraná is the oldest university in Brazil. We have more than 90 uh, graduate programs and I'm really uh, happy to be part of this university. So our lab is trying to uh, do mainly vector-borne and transboundary zoonotic disease over time. And I would like to uh, highlight some key uh, data that we achieved uh, on the, in the last years. So th since we are talking about uh, go high impact on capacity building uh, worldwide, I would like to highlight uh, this specific uh, student. So my former PhD student, uh, Jessica uh, Valenti, which is now a, a veterinarian at the Curitiba city. So she started with us in 2011. She was actually uh, at the first place a student of Celsius working on, on microbiology and, and bacteria. And then she, when I came to Curitiba, she came with me to the residence masters and PhD. And on the last ICO file, she was awarded with a fund, funding to attend the ICOFA pre-Congress and Congress uh, and present uh, some data. So she went there and she won a, a award of the best presentation and, and best study there. And this is a clear example how Go High uh, and make some impact on lives that, uh, on people that really came from uh, low-income regions. 
So at the first place, Jessica didn't read a paper in English. And at the end of her PhD, she was able to attend a meeting, international meeting, present in English and, and winning an award. So this is go high. So this is why we are celebrating 10 years of capacity building. So on this partner, we, we just host uh, last, last, at the beginning of this month, an international Congress uh, meeting on epidemiology of vector-borne disease. So uh, we really get the 10 years celebrating uh, actions and say, okay, let's do, uh, let's take a, a close and a look for vector-borne disease since everyone is just looking for COVID and do a very good uh, online course so to, to spread the vector-borne disease knowledge and importance worldwide. So the course was really advertised at Ohio State University. So Somalia University, many uh, universities in Brazil already advertised, which really made the difference on the impact of the course. So we had a week with 17 speakers from different countries, more than 200 attendees from all over the world, and we did some uh, Mentimeter. And as you see, everyone were excited with updates and the awesomes and preventions and One Health approach. So this is what we are doing during this terrible pandemic crisis. We are trying to stimulate mainly, I think that during this pandemic, we had a lot of mental health issues occurring worldwide. And in my experience, our main goal from now on is trying to stimulate this young generation, uh, which is high technology, uh, but sometimes forgetting some basic concepts and, and classic methods, uh, such as taxonomy of ticks and vectors in general and so on, and try to bring them back to a new reality to try to really continue to, to, to make a better world. I would like to acknowledge many institutions that I did not uh, had the time to present here, Sao Paulo State University, University of Londrina, and many others that are really working with us in combined projects. And I know that this is more a Latin America lecture, but I would like to highlight and show you just a, a few slides that we are really a global One Health initiative. So our project uh, is spread to Africa and we have built a very good uh, partnership uh, with Somalia during uh, the ECOFI that was hosted in Doha. So when Hiki was there with me, so we had uh, actually a faculty from the Auburn University, Professor Abdallah, who was uh, fully sponsored to attend the meeting, the ICOFE meeting in Doha. And he presented some data on HIV positive cases. And Somalia for years have been um, very uh, attacked by civil war and stigma. And we really did a very good partnership since 2007 in order to build capacity and really uh, improve the quality of life in their country. So here we have our university team. We are performing many studies on ruminants, camels, and, and, and human health. And for those years, we already have some PhD and master's students concluded. Now we have postdocs and new master's students. Yesterday I talked to Ahmed, which is currently a uh, director of the university of uh, Aber University and, uh, and Abdul Karim, which is a former uh, master's. He went back to uh, Somalia, you know, and he's the director of the official slaughterhouse that they have. So this is another example how Go High is making impact and helping uh, people to graduate and really improve uh, science. So we have been working many transversal courses, uh, online courses, uh, of course, always coming back to vector-borne side, but 
in general, molecular biology techniques, research methodology, and epidemiological studies. And due to our great partnership uh, with Somalia, we also included the Gambia, which is a small country on the west part of Africa. And we just built a partnership with the University of the Gambia to really study the impact of vector-borne and transboundary disease. We started with cattle, uh, but we are also doing some uh, important studies on the knowledge and attitude of veterinarians and veterinary assistants there uh, really to uh, take some knowledge of the country to know what, what are the next steps that we should do in order to uh, improve the life quality. But during these times, we are not only uh, scientific uh, nerds, let's say like that. We also celebrate the friendship. So Gohai is also uh, not uh, scientific only. We can say that we, we are a family of friends that are working together to make a better world. So here it was the last visit that we had in Ohio State 2019, just one week before the ICOFE in Quebec, we were able to go to a Buckeye a game, a packed of people, and of course, good projects also started from this, from this game. So I would like to thank all the institutions, friends, and students that are joining uh, during this terrible pandemic and I'm really happy to be part of Go High and looking forward for the next 10 years. Thank you Dr. Vieira um, for this <laughs> not only wonderful but very uplifting presentation uh, despite all the difficulties it has it's a very optimistic view of the world um, and we have a question from uh, the from the audience, uh, from Vanessa Dos Santos, what motivated you to work with vector-borne diseases? At what point in your career did did that actually emerge as your direction of research? This is a tricky question, Vanessa. Thank you. You could you you should ask that inside the lab. <laughs> Vanessa is my student, so. I started to work, Vanessa, with vector-borne disease. Um, I really started during my residency. So I was in a, a veterinary pathologist, a clinical pathologist, but I, instead of looking blood in smears, I, I was uh, entirely time looking for inclusions inside the, the cells. And these remote me to, to the vectors that were responsible to include that inclusions on the cells. So I started from there. And the time I met the ticks, so I, I fall in love and then I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what a unique love story, right? <laughs> um, and um, the, I, I, well, I also want to encourage audience again to post questions on the Q&A using Q&A function of the webinar uh, and not the chat, the Q&A, you have uh, that. This way they're also visible to all of us. So with that, uh, I have a question. You mentioned quite a bit, uh, Dr. Vieira, the effect of the pandemic particularly in this context of Global One Health, one would think that there are bad and good uh, impacts of the pandemic on your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so let's start with the bad. The bad is that um, we lost a friend. So we, we lost our technician which uh, Kelly uh, left us uh, some month ago and, and we really uh, were punched at that time. And we, after that event, we had to uh, rebuild ourselves and trying to stimulate 
not only ourselves, but mainly the students. She was really close to the students. And this, was, this will be the stark reminder for all my career because we have to remember day by day what uh, was the impact of this pandemic in our lives. And as we lost a friend, many other people in the world lost friends and huge uh, researchers and young students and those that were only on the beginning of the dreams. But the pandemic uh, show us that One Health is not just a, an initiative or a concept. One Health is the reality for the future. So uh, day by day, if we continue to deny that, mainly by our president, uh, unfortunately, we will not make a better world and we will have another pandemic and we will, we will lose another friends and students and researchers. But the pandemics also take us from the comfortable zone, I can say that. I myself, I can say that I was the one that really avoided any online stuff, but it's actually really made us better because we, I can say from last, from the this month course that would never happen, 17 speakers from different countries. Uh, so the government does not give us money to pay travel costs and building all together to make these events. So now we can meet. We learned how to meet and how to interact. And I think that the, their answer time due to that make us better uh, partners. So I was missing Enrique for like two years and a half and we are here face to face. Of course, we cannot have a good drink or good conversation in person, but we can interact, we can collaborate. And the impact also, Tanya, was I don't have my students here. I, I know I have some Amir and Shai here from Somalia. They are crazy to come to Brazil and international policies and, and health uh, uh, problems uh, impact their uh, knowledge uh, here in on hands-on lab. I think the, Thank you. I can say that. Thank you. And I would like to transition right into the panel part of, um, uh, of, of this event and pose the same question to you, Dr. Delgado Suarez. What was the impact of the pandemic, good or bad, on your work um, that you can add to what Dr. Vieira was talking about? Thank you, Tang. Uh, well, the pandemic um, uh, struck here very, very badly. And uh, the negative impact was mainly in terms of uh, we had to stop, actually. We had to stop uh, research activities at some point, several times. So some of the projects uh, we are conducting by now were delayed because of that. And for instance, something that I didn't like at all, we had to come out with a publication with uh, just a part of our initial plan, right? Because if we were to wait for the pandemic to finish, then the information would become obsolete. So this is the, the most uh, striking thing that we have faced, that the delay. Fortunately, for some months already, um, since we were in yellow, yellow, yellow color of the epidemiology uh, uh, traffic light, let's say, sem semaphore, we say here, um we've been able to go to the lab and we haven't stopped but we had several times that we we were just uh, starting to go and then never mind you have to go out not allowed to work anymore so this is the this being critical because it uh, disrupts the whole plan of uh, research that we have initially that's the the, the negative part and the positive one is that uh, i agree with rafael um, we, when we organized, uh, let's say, conventional events, it's uh, kind of difficult to to get together many people, right? We were lucky if we had 100 or 200 attendees. But right now, we, we can have 
400, 500 with no problem at all with this uh, technology. It still feels a bit weird, but uh, at least uh, it's a way to overcome talking about overcoming barriers. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a positive thing that we managed to adjust. It's like Darwin, Darwin, Darwin way of, <laughs> of uh, surviving, right? Thank you, yes. And, you know, global is part of the uh, title, right? Global One Health. And certainly pandemics bring it to the forefront of the global aspect uh, of, of the world's health. With that, uh, what are the challenges that you've, that you've had working uh, globally? And uh, what are the advantages as well? And this is a question that is coming from Get Natalie. Uh, so I would pose that first uh, to you, Dr. Vieira. Great question. <laughs> so uh, I think that is not the hard part. I think the first, let's say, the adjustments. We we have to to when we are working globally, we have to really first we have to really study the other part. So they have local habits, uh, religious, and other. Uh, parts that we really need to study and be prepared to, to make any, any proposal to change uh, things. And the good part is that uh, we, we do not stop learning. So that's why we here, we can collaborate and we can uh, get uh, good, good, um, and success studies and the bad ones and we can combine for each side of the of the the global uh part because uh mainly do, during this pandemic we clearly see that all research data goes to covid should should be this way but we are forgetting a bunch of disease and other uh stuff that will hit us as soon as we start to look at it. That's why Laura and I, we are uh, discussing a project because, because we are here, I don't know, in Mexico, in Hiki, but some parts in Brazil, we are struggling with dengue and, and, and chikungunya cases and no one is caring about. And, and of course, globally is happening many other uh, so we have cholera uh, and episodes we have ebola uh, trying to hit us back we have rift valley fever we have a lot of uh, internationally uh, disease we just had the first case of west nile virus here in Purnai state last month so thank you and dr delgado suarez yeah. Same question to you about uh, the challenges and advantages of work. Yeah, thank you. Um, we believe uh, there is a famous phrase that if you're not global, you can be global, right? You can't be global. And uh, this is one of the challenges that I have experienced here when, when we're talking about this, uh, let's say, revolutionary uh, points of view like global one health, and these are very progressive uh, in terms of uh, how do you arrange or organize people to, to collaborate, right? And uh, one of the things that we really struggle with is that our local situation, most of the time is not prepared for this kind of projects. So sometimes, uh, for instance, with this project that I was commenting during my presentation of, or during the a question that I answered, I don't remember, uh, the one that for, for the CDC call of research, uh, we really had a hard time here arranging things for this project because it, 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 this was a, a One Health approach project. So the intention is to collect samples from uh, sewage water, surface waters, animals 
clinical cases. And we have here internally such a fragmented system because uh, hospitals are going their way. And uh, here I was uh, contacting many hospitals who wants to collaborate and many of them have many constraints. Oh, I cannot collaborate because I'm not allowed, things like that. So sometimes the local structure of the country becomes a, a barrier itself. So this is, a, if we are talking about global One Health approach, this is really a challenge because uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult. At the end, we managed, we managed to, to find, and we even discovered it was uh, something that I, I could not believe there were networks of, of health institutions doing some antimicrobial resistance. That, that was a, a discovery for me. It was a very nice one. And at the end, we managed to, to set up. But this is, uh, in the meantime, I lost like months <laughs> doing this. It's not easy sometimes. So I would say this is one of the main challenges uh, when regarding uh, global work. And also, uh, it, it is difficult. This is uh, requires teamwork, and sometimes, uh, or in, in any in any situation, one person is not enough. So I cannot fulfill all the demands of working in such big projects. We really need to set up a network of collaboration, and uh, yeah, it's related to the same to the same thing. The advantage is that uh, being such a progressive approach and uh, modern and uh, aggressive in terms of discovery and contribution to science, it attracts people. So at the same time that you, you may find some constraints, at least when people hear about that, I get their attention. And uh, it is, uh, let's say, a little bit easier because of the own nature of these projects to attract attention of people and people uh, have a, are prone to collaborate. It is not a personal thing, it is just a, a matter of a system, how it is organized. Thank you. Thank you. There is a follow-up question from Vanessa De Santos. Can you talk more specifically about the, your experience and the impact of projects developed in Africa and how they contribute to Global One Health? So we talk about, we're talking in this meeting about uh, Latin America, but both of you have collaborations in Africa and um, what do those projects bring uh, uh, into this experience and into the global network? And perhaps Dr. Delgado Suarez, uh, you can continue. Okay. Uh, well, I don't really have uh, like indicators to be able to answer that such uh, very specifically. Uh, it would be more of a hard thing, <laughs> emotional thing, but. Uh, during my stay in Ethiopia and later in Kenya, I was able to interact with people, different parts of Ethiopia, Kenya as well. And uh, out of that, uh, I had contact with, uh, actually by through uh, Dr. Wondosen Gabriel, who was in contact, and I managed to uh, engage, let's say, uh, some people from Ethiopian universities in the FDA Genome Tracking Initiative to help a PhD student to have their isolates sequenced in the US. We're still working on that. And uh, it was a very nice experience overall because uh, people were very grateful and they, feel, they felt like they really learned because uh, we focused on giving them tools to act independently, at least in the very basic things, which are the ones that I know. I'm not really a specialist like you, Tanya, in big data management. But um, at least we share what we know, and uh, we could see the impact in terms of how they managed to do things, uh, at least in the course, which was the small uh, window that I had. And uh, to see them happy uh, with this, it was very, uh, it was very touching on my side. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Vieira, uh, following up on uh bi-directional collaboration and uh, impact? So the impact is that we are inside the Global One Health Initiative. So it doesn't make sense to have specialists and research minds in 
some continents and does not have one in another one. So uh, the, the good thing to collaborate is that we are really uh, building and, and putting that seed and uh, to see in a future like huge trees uh, making fruits in Africa. So we need people there really uh, um, uh, ready to respond like and prevent pandemics. So I think is that the good thing and impact that we are doing, mainly the Dr. Gerbreyer's work uh, leading us on this umbrella. And we, we, we are not like, I, I can say Mexico and Brazil, we are not rich countries, but we are prepared also to help and, 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 and collaborate uh, in strong projects. So I think it's, it's the most important thing to highlight. Thank you. Um, the, the, the next question comes from uh, Get Natalie, and it's a great question. Uh, he would like to uh, hear about the, the plans for sustainability and growth for, the, for this great initiative. And I would like to add also, what are the critical things that you would need to make your partnership and initiative sustainable? Uh, good one, getting it. <laughs> the first one is funding. So we are working with Somalia since 2017 and we don't have any grant. We are not being funded by any agency. So what we are doing is really a task force from our hearts. So we, sometimes we put money from our pockets. I can say, I clearly say that. And basically, uh, since we are talking about Latin America as well, is that in Latin America, we are not uh, able to, I, I can say from my side, I don't know, Hickey, we are not like eligible to lead some strong proposals because our country agencies does not fund it. Uh, NIH, sometimes you have to be based in USA to lead a strong project. And sometimes we are like struggling in, in finding uh, ways of funding to, to, to make this initiative. So I don't know the future get net. We are really like that now because we have the Gambia join us and we have another African part, uh, uh, partners wanting to jump us and we don't have the funding. So we really need to make a task force uh, on this field. Otherwise, I will, we will have to stop uh, at some point without funding. Well, I hope we, that's not the bleak future we're looking at. Um, Dr. Delgado Suarez. Yeah, in my case, in my case, I would say that if we want to be sustainable on the long run, and um, my my view, this is my my own personal opinion. Uh, I think that we may be successful as long as I manage to set up, let's say, a success case locally here with a, just one project that it is successful. If I manage to set up like this, uh, all institutions which are so fragmented right now, and we managed to set up a success case, this will give us a, a, a very good advantage to repeat it and to expand it. So this is my plan. I, I have all my hopes in this uh, CDC project, which is very comprehensive. If we get the funding, of course, I agree with Rafael, funding is, is also a key, but we need to work hard to get the funding and there are ways, there is a lot of funds out there. We need to go and fight for them. And as long as we propose anything, all the funding agencies progressively are getting aware. And this pandemic is also a positive thing of the pandemic that has uh, caught the attention of how important Global One Health is. And uh, yeah, I would say my strategy would be that. I would, I would try to connect. This is a huge challenge though. I would try to connect to set up like a network of collaboration and from that point, we can jump and maybe bring uh, Africa or Asia, whatever, but we need to start locally first. Thank you. 
Thank you. And, and can I make a comment, Tanya, just course, to complete? Of course. Another way get net on sustainability is that uh, I, I would like to hear in Hika as well, but uh, we were talking here about actions like science, publication, mm -hmm. and products. When we come to publications, another thing that we are uh, struggling with Latin American, some part of African study is that uh, everyone is supporting uh, open science everywhere. But the, the, the reality is that when we try to submit some papers on some journals, they don't care if we are from a low income or not. They want the publication fee. And sometimes we applied for a weaver and they say, hey, we have nine authors from Africa, but you are from Brazil, so you have to pay. So this is not global one health. This is about money. So this is another sustainability thing that we have to look for the way we, are, we will publish our data in the future. That is a very, very um, good point. And uh, that leads to my, my question about how do you combine the local and global perspectives in your work? Um, so there is a lot of things that are very local, uh, building local networks, uh, looking really at the diseases uh, within the context of a, of a region. Uh, sometimes very small region, and the global collaborations, global networks allow um, for transfer of knowledge that you've both mentioned, for perhaps sharing of resources and uh, com complementary sort of perspective, you know, building capacity in one aspect versus another. So uh, where do you see this global local perspectives mesh best? in the Global One Health uh, Initiative? And uh, what would be the best way, how would you see the best way of sharing resources and, and expertise through this, um, through this global local setup? So uh, Dr. Delgado Suarez, if you can start. Thank you. Well, I, I want to pick up from uh, Lazar Pell's intervention because it's kind of related. We're talking about publications and the challenge that uh, are there. Uh, what we are doing here is, uh, especially when talking about local and global, we share, let's say, we share the publications between mm, local interest. Let's say uh, we can publish in a Mexican journal, which is a uh, the nature is more local, and uh, the, most, the, the things that are more global in nature, we publish them in international journals. Of course, there is a cost you need to balance in, for us as a researcher, which are, we are evaluated in a way, but I don't care. I really don't care. It's a matter of balancing. I don't care if they get a point out of my qualifications, but it is a, a good thing to, to, to convince, to to convince people because once they they start to see some project with a, this approach, this is a different thing, and they are this is becoming more frequently seen locally, then people get more aware of that, and it is easier to to get them involved. So they, they increasingly want to see things uh, similar to that. So uh, I can say that, uh, for instance, uh, since we started to submit papers to this uh, Mexican journal, um, uh, they they are very let's say they are very welcome. They are kind of uh, they are kind of inviting me to to submit more. So it's a matter of balancing, and uh, to make it a match global and, and international uh, or local, sorry, uh, global and local. Uh, to match in, and make this possible. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a tricky question because it's so complex, the situation uh, locally, that uh, you need to be, it's a game war, but you need to be lucky to get out of that uh, and have a, a success story. But uh, I would say that collaboration itself, when it, when it comes to collaboration itself, and it's, uh, it's easier 
it's easier to make it match uh, when it's coming from abroad. And then normally this collaboration brings funds as well. We have not, uh, for instance, in our case, with this big trial that we have with the University of Maryland and the APA, we don't have millions of dollars. It's a, it's a rather discreet funding, but it's, it, it is good for our countries. And uh, we have people that uh, we haven't been able to do that uh, this month, this last month, because the government labs are closed and the, the uh, people are not allowed to be there like 30% of the capacity of the lab. But in the past, we managed to send our students to the sequencing labs, to new, new technologies. And this is the way uh, that we have been able to, to engage people in these global issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Vieira, a few minutes, a few a couple of minutes, a few. I totally agree with Henrique. Yes, it's, it's, I think that one strategy would really our uh, representatives sit together and, and really uh, you start to apply One Health, not only just talking about One Health, I think is what we need from here uh, on. So if they do that, like they, if they give us at least 5% of each uh, uh, GDP, we, we will make some difference for sure. <laughs> That is ambitious. Thank you. And there is a comment from uh, Christina Petanbrewer that uh, uh, writes, I encourage to collaborate and partner with other One Health groups in Brazil and Latin America to join efforts and funding that have been working for the past 10 years as well. Uh, together as partners as one, look at the One Health Special Editions in Frontiers. Uh, and as one, we all have um, sustainable funding and research support together at One Health Brazil and uh, One Health Latin America, Iberico y El Caribe. So with that uh, and uh, this great comment of partnership and the message of partnership, I would like to thank both of our speakers, um, Dr. Rafael Vieira and Dr. Enrique Delgado Suarez. Thank you very much for your perspective, your experience and your partnership in the Global One Health initiative. Thank you for the, to the audience for participation and for your questions and hope to continue. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Berger, for your wonderful moderation. Thank you, thank, thank, you. thank you, Laura. Thank you, good evening to all, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.